I'm delighted to welcome to chair our final uh, keynote speech, uh, Dr. Susan Babai. Susan is a professor in Islamic and Iranian arts at the Courtauld at the University of London. Uh, she was born in Iran and attended the University of Tehran's Faculty of Fine Arts and later earned her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. Suzanne has published widely on Islamic and Iranian arts, and she's currently working on a book about Persian art, food and taste, and on an exhibition about arts of the great Mongol state. Suzanne, a very warm welcome to you. I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you very much. It's delightful to be here. I thank you for this invitation and for being here with everyone. And most, uh, most profoundly, I'm grateful for being the one to uh, chair this keynote uh, lecture performance by uh, the collective Slavs and Tatar, uh, um, about whom uh, you have read quite a lot. I've known uh, uh, the the sort of collective in by name of persons individuals Payam who is on screen and I assume he is the solo performance person today and Kasha his partner in crime uh, for a very long time I've known them uh, when I was teaching at uh, Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and they were doing a a performance project with students in Munich, uh, to which I had the privilege of, of having some, uh, with which I had the privilege of some involvement. Um, I have also had the chance to write about uh, the work of Slavs and Tatars. Um, the, uh, one of the most creative ways to think about and really act upon the idea of Eurasian expanse, something that interests me greatly from a scholarly point of view. And uh, this exhibition on the great Mongol state and the arts that crisscross the entire Eurasia are really um, uh, sort of the, the sort of parallel, if you will, to this particular, um, uh, particular mode of thinking, which uh, Slavs and Tatars have uh, pushed forth with great importance, as it were, uh, through their work. Um, I am going to, uh, if I may, pass the, um, the podium to Payon to start his, uh, his talk, his performance, and then we come back to, um, to have a, a bit of a reflection on what he talks about. Um, is that okay, Payon? Are you ready? Okay. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Suzanne, for a, for a very generous introduction. Thank you to all the, all the organizers, Nick, uh, Claire, and the, the Henry Moore Institute. I'll just jump into it because I know we're short on time today uh, and we want to get into the discussion, which is uh, most important. So I'll start by sharing the screen. It began with a willful imprecision. Try putting your lips onto the Botoxed, bruised lips of history. This is not a romantic gesture. No need to spiff up, nor to look good. Resuscitation is a matter of urgency. Breathe in. Hold the nose. Catch your breath. Pump the chest. Tuck your tongue away. No French kisses here. And breathe, breathe in. This conspiration is called hamdami, a breathing together of sensuality and spirituality. It requires of us an affective understanding of time, not the analytical one we're taught in schools. A salival, not just cerebral approach to historicity, a lippy look to the past. We must respect our... So I wanted to just quickly... Um... Uh, speak a little bit about the role uh, today uh, of transliteration in our practice. And transliteration is, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm sure most are, are rather native English speakers on the panel, on the, in the audience, or, or if not um, familiar enough with English, is that transliteration is essentially the, the, the conversion of scripts uh, from one alphabet to another, but maintaining the same language, right? We often describe transliteration as a, a trashier, younger sibling to translation. 
translation, there's translation studies all around the world. It's very, uh, it's very uh, um, robust translation departments all around the world. It's a, it's a, it's a field of, increasingly a field of study on its own departments. Um, but the transliteration is a transactional thing, meaning that you keep the you keep the language in the, in, as it is, but you just simply change its alphabet. And for anybody who reads writes a non Latin based language, you're, we're doing this all the time, right? Uh, in the sense that I just wrote to Susan in Persian, let's say uh, using Latin letters, I didn't relearn the QWERTY alphabet in, in, in Persian, and same in sort of Greeklish or Russian and with Cyrillic, etc. But what transliteration allows us to do is to ask certain very stupid questions to important smart subject matter. And um, part of tonight's uh, today, today's uh, talk is essentially to what extent um, to what extent this idea of wise foolishness uh, is is key to understanding certain limits of language and those limits of language both as a means of expression but also as a material form. Now, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our practice, these are just, uh, uh, as you might know, we started out as a kind of publishing concern. We've published around 12 books, I, I guess, to date. The most recent one is the sort of orangey one on the top called The Contest of the Fruits with MIT Press about Uyghur literary culture. These are not catalogs as I often uh, go to the lengths of explaining in the sense that uh, I think the catalogs should be illegal in the art world. Uh, I think they should be, uh, it's, it's the equivalent of insider trading essentially is it's, uh, they're, they're enormous and shameful wastes of paper uh, and, uh, and they're not very critical because the artist is often the one asking the, the critic to write something. Uh, we believe in a kind of robust firewall between these, these things. And so um, if people want to write about us, they do so in, or in other organs of media that we do not have any influence over and, uh, and not in the books and not in our own books in a sense. Um, these are platforms for research and we'll be discussing a couple of these books this evening. Um, as uh, the previous little clip showed, this idea of, of, of an affect approach to knowledge is one of the reasons why we sort of started Slavs and Tatars in the sense that um, it was not only asking a question about uh, this, this, this geographical space that, uh, that Susan mentioned between the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China, which is in our bio, is in some way you could say a foil to understanding other forms of knowledge uh, and other organs of knowledge in the sense that we're not against the Enlightenment in any way, but Let's say that uh, we believe that there's just as there should there's just as many types of knowledge as there are organs of knowledge. It's not the only not, there's not only the brain and the kind of the analytical faculty, and there's just as many types of knowledge, or there should be as many types of knowledge as there are places of knowledge, in a sense. Uh, and that's really one of the kind of the the, the 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 key to our understanding our geographical remit, is if you, unfortunately, if you if you go to philosophy departments in Tehran and uh, Jakarta and Harvard and Heidelberg. Uh, most of the time, it's quite a similar, a similar uh, curriculum or syllabus, genealogy of thinkers, and that's a pity. It's not because there's a conspiracy. It's simply there's a, there's a kind of a, a lazy consolidation, um, which means that uh, you know there's so many thinkers that we come across in our research that are not the, the kind of the usual names that all of us have heard of, um, and this idea of, of 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 putting your lips onto the lips of history is is also a kind of an anti-enlightenment stance in the sense that it, we don't necessarily believe that there needs to be this clinical distance between us and the subject matter and the text that we're working on. Meaning that, you know, instead of having this kind of this, the, the gloves and the, and the objective distance, why not have a kind of a bear hug with our subject matter? Why not have a very sweaty approach, a very intimate approach to the, te the text that we're dealing with? And, and language of course plays a, a key role in that um, as does this idea of wise foolishness uh, Mola Nasruddin is this kind of latter-day mascot of ours. He's a 12th century um, fool, wise fool. Uh, and uh, and he's uh, you find a version of him everywhere that were Muslims uh, historically, in large Muslim populations or uh, significant Muslim populations. So from Croatia all the way to China and down to the Sahara and Sub-Sahara, there's a version of Nasruddin. And he has different names, Hoja in the Turkic countries, Mola in, in Iran, let's say. Joha in, in Arabic countries, Afanti in, 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 uh, in, in China, Effendi from Effendi the Turkish. Now, um, Nasruddin is often looking backwards towards the past, but moving towards the future. So he's moving forward, but looking always backwards. And this, and this we call a kind of, we, we call this after Antoine Compagnon, an anti-modernist approach to time, meaning that, again, it's not about being against modernity, but Compagnon defines the true modernist as he does it in 19th century literature from Peggy and Chateaubriand all the way to Baudelaire and, and Bach, 
But he says a true modernist are those who are not like Marinetti and Mayakovsky and let's say today, Elon Musk, who believe that the futurists, they kind of believe in machine age or that sort of technology will deliver us from all of our uh, limits. But that the true modernists are those people who have a kind of a, a, um, a conflictual relationship to the passing of the pre-modern time. Meaning that, you know, with an eye on the rear of a mirror, uh, as, Bath, as Sartre described Baudelaire, um, or riding backwards on your donkey, let's say, uh, as Nasruddin does. Now, um, this question of, of, uh, of foolishness also is important uh, in the sense that um, one of the things that we, you know, we came rel relatively late to art in, in our thirties. And one of the things that we discovered, we, we found very surprising is that the overwhelming majority of art is, um, is presented very clearly as it is, as if it were art. And what I mean by that is that the present, it's, it, we always struck us as very strange that if you're, if, if you're an artist, why would you reveal the fact that you're presenting art from already hundred meters away? Why, you know, in terms of the lighting, the presentation, the medium, the references. And in, so in some sense, we believe that the role, let's say in our practice, there's three activities. There's the publications, there's the lectures, performances, and then there's the artwork, let's say, the kind of traditional artworks, right? The kind of the material the sculptures, the installations, et cetera. If the lectures and the, and, the, and the books are articulating a certain series of concerns, like I'm doing right now about transliteration, then in our view, the artwork, again, the traditional understanding of the artwork has to disarticulate those very concerns. Now, to disarticulate means to kind of scramble the very message you've just, it's to undo the sweater that you've just knitted but again, why would you reveal your cards immediately? So in some sense, the kind of the key is as an artist for us is to, and it's harder and harder the more you go forward is to, to maintain that ambiguity of, of what you're presenting as art. That is that it should function as art. So this kind of transformative function that art historically has had or ideally has ostensibly, this kind of educational and transformative function. So not just kind of an entertainment education axis, but also this transformation in the kind of metaphysical sense, let's say. Uh, but it has to do that without, calling itself clearly as art, right? That otherwise it, you, you've already, in some sense, given away half of your, your message. Now for us, one of the kind of keys, key ways to doing this is, is, is to maintain these two, two extreme levels, which is uh, uh, two, extreme, two extremes of the spectrum, which is what we call kind of um, the metaphysical splits. So not the splits of the legs, but the splits of the mind. Um, and this is something you find in Catholicism with coincidentia oppositorum and Sufism, this idea that for example, to describe the, the holy, you have to use irrational language. Um, um, cognitive dissonance is another somewhat near near example of that. Um, you find it in our in our very bio, right? That normally you wouldn't put the, the former Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China together. They're anachronistic, one's from the 13th century, one's from the 20th century. Um, and also in the two kind of concerns that we often have, geopolitical concerns being sort of communism and political Islam, which are still very much reverberating to this day, sadly. Now, to the question of, of, of transliteration, which is the, the prism through which I want to think about this idea of poetry and sculpture, is that, um, as I mentioned, transliteration, this is an, our first example of transliteration. And you can see on the bottom, it says, dig the booty of monoglots, but marry my child a polyglot. Now, on the top, it's the same in the Persian Arabic script, Persian Arabic script, and in the middle, it's a Cyrillic script. Dig da booty of monoglot, but marry my child a polyglot. Um, Again, in the registers of language, also you have these two extremes, right? Normally, people who start a sentence with dig the booty don't end it with polyglot or monoglot because they're two different registers of language, one from the street, let's say, one more academic or official, let's say, the fushat of English. Um, and, uh, and this transliteration is, in some ways, um, it, for us, it enables us to think of language uh, and text as three-dimensional, that is to get behind the text. And what I mean by getting behind the text doesn't mean to support the text, it's the opposite. It's, um, for, uh, it's very important when you're doing research-based art, let's say like many many artists have been doing over the past two decades, um, it's very important to some, some sense to break the, the sources, to disrespect the sources of your research. And to do so, to disrespect your sources, you actually have to, have to respect them. Uh, and to respect, you have to disrespect, meaning that, of course, you know, the, the question that often is posed to us as artists and, and should be posed to many artists that do research and discursive work is, what are you, what are we bringing to the table that hasn't already been done by academics, by scholars, by thinkers, by writers, by poets, by 
activists, by journalists. And I think, again, it comes back to that question of scrambling or disarticulating, that art can disarticulate in a way that other media, or other professions cannot disarticulate. Um, and what I mean by the back door is literally the back door, right? What does the back door mean? Historically, as a space, the back door is a, is a space, for example, you know, in, in Houston, Texas, where I was raised, the back door was where the, the staff, you know, there was a door toward the front and there's a back, back door for the immigrants, the kind of the, the dark skinned people to work, right? Or the back door is also where kind of queer space is often located. So it's a space where labor and desire and sort of and, and subversion come together, but it's a way to also, you know, the back door uh, also, of course, in slang, meaning kind of through penetration, anal penetration, back door is really a way to, to subvert a text and to, to, to subvert a text, you have to create it. You have to, I think that in some ways we have to, we have to spatialize it so that we can go behind it. Uh, and, 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 and to disrespect it and to respect it, right? To, to respect it by breaking it and not simply regurgitating it, but, but also knowing it intimately, which enables us to some way disrespect it. Now, this is a series of, uh, of works that literally deal with this uh, question of transliteration. Um, and they're of, of course an homage uh, to uh, Proteas. Um, now, there are all of these, these panels which were presented in Venice, um, they all employ alphabets which are inappropriate for the language itself. So the question of legibility of, that, we've, that we've been hearing about the, yesterday's panel, of course, is question of how legible a text should be. I'm also of the mind that text in work shouldn't be too legible. Um, now, there's been criticisms of this. Uh, of course, I think the Financial Times review of the, of the biennial singled us out and said this was typical biennial banter that's, in, that's, in, that's inaccessible or illegible to most people. And of course, what they missed was that of course it's illegible, it's, 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 it's meant to be in the wrong alphabet. There's no, nobody, there's no way you can speak these languages, but of course it's also, it shows the kind of limits of the Anglophone world in the sense that, uh, you know, there's 15, I guess, what, 12, five times three, 15 panels here in at least five different languages and at least four different scripts. So they might be inaccessible to an English speaker, but they're no more accessible to a Russian speaker or to an Arabic speaker. The middle panel is the one we're going to focus on with the bubbles and Arabic uh, shortly. Now, um, the, the first publication that we dealt with with this kind of obsession with phonemes and, and, the, and the graph themes that are ascribed to phonemes is, uh, is a book called <sighs> all about the, the fricative <sighs> um, and namely, uh, you can see in the left, pan, uh, left to carpet here, and on the tongue, there's a, there's a kind of a pi, which is a chet in Hebrew. Then there's an x, which is a che in Cyrillic. And then there's a, the, the Arabic ch. Um, and for some reason, ch seems to have a kind of very um, important sacred uh, sim symbolism or role in these three alphabets, whether it's Chlebnikov, uh, the Russian futurist poet who talks about it, or whether it's the, uh, the abjad in Arabic numerology or even in the Kabbalah, or even the fact that Chet is kind of the, represents the, 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 the numerology of number eight on the eighth day of the circumcision. Chet also means life. So it's a, it's a very important phoneme. And of course, what interests us is the fact that it's, it's a phoneme that's pronounced by constricting the passage of air as opposed to um, normal, normal languages is, is, vo is voice through pushing air through your trachea and your throat. And this is actually by constricting that air. Now, I should say one more thing about these panels is that uh, what's important about these is that, is that they are in fact only, let, only understandable if you read them out loud. Uh, and this is a kind of a, an underlying interest of ours is again, because we started out as a reading group and a publishing concern is that to what extent we can redeem the act of reading as, a, as, a, as an oral practice, right? That if we think about the history of reading, it's only been a silent, intimate, individual, private uh, uh, activity for about 150, 200 years. For the, for the large majority of the history of reading, history of uh, reading was an oral collective practice, right? You, things were meant to be read out loud. These you can only understand by reading out loud, again, because they're in the wrong alphabet, each of them. Um, Chlebnikov, who I mentioned, a Russian futurist poet, the kind of the emo counterpart to Mayakovsky's kind of jock, um, wrote extensively about this, this movement called Zaum, trans-rationalism, if you will. Uh, and it was a movement to kind of understand again, these, these, these limits of ratio in language, and he, and he of course also used numerology, but he, he described as a kind of, a, as a, also as, a, as an important sort of ur 
phoneme in the, in, the, in the Slavic languages. He identified 40 Slavic words that have to do with um, habitation, shelter. And that's of course very important in the kind of forensic etymological uh, etymologies to understand sort of what ground, sky, and shelter have to do. He also was important. He was also was very much concerned with this idea of the inner declension of words, which goes against Saussurean ideas. That this, that of course Saussurean structuralist thinking says that you know the, the succession of letters is, is no meaning to them. Kladnikov believed that actually every letter had an agency vis-a-vis -vis other letters, meaning again, if you think about it, it's, it's a spatial agency of each letter that it has a responsibility or an activity. So if chlam, meaning junk or rubble in, in Russian, if you, if you replace the L with an R, it sublimates it by becoming a shrine, for example. Um, I'll read, um, since Elizabeth read, read so eloquently the Prigofon, I'll also try to read the Chlebnikov. Um, in the Russian, it reads, nash kochen ochen azabochen, noz atochen tochen ochen. Um, we didn't translate this English, uh, it's, but it's quite well translated, even though it's not as, 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 as good as the original. Uh, it says, let us not be heads of lettuce. Let us not let knives upset us. Now, Chlebnikov was, uh, he believed in this internal rhyming scheme as well, not just the internal declension of words. And you can see this, of course, in pop culture, sort of uh, the importance of people like uh, Notorious B.I.G., who actually, whose, whose lyrics were actually, uh, were first noted because of their internal rhyming schemes. Of also uh, this, this idea of za'um, mm, as I told you, uh, it was translated as, as beyond, as transrational. Za means sort of beyond and across or, or trans, uh, and and um is ratio or the the mind in some sense, uh, intelligence. Um, and we didn't like this this uh, in this uh, this translation, so we we actually finally found a, from uh, one of the translators of Chlebnikov, Paul Schmidt. Mm, he translated it as beyond sense, which I thought was a really beautiful way of, of translating this because within beyond sense, you have nonsense, but also Chlebnikov would have been very happy to understand, to hear, hear that within beyond sense, you also have beyond say, because he believed in these kind of fortuitous understandings. And Chlebnikov, of course, also as a, it's, you know, people don't often put together Russian intellectual life or poetry and let's say Islamic mysticism and Sufism, but they're not so far apart in the sense that First of all, Chlebnikov was mistakenly under, uh, received as a dervish, a Russian dervish, when he came into the northern Caspian region of Iran to support this gentleman here uh, in a very short-lived Soviet-supported uh, uh, socialist republic on the Caspian Sea. Um, Chlebnikov wasn't a Sufi, wasn't a dervish. He just looked so terrible that people thought he was like a, a mendicant of some sorts. But this, again, this insistence on, 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 um, on using the negative or using sort of uh, um, to sort of, say, sort of sayings like apperception is the highest form of perception, this idea of using the, the opposite of, of ratio, of, of kind of the irrational to describe the holy is something that you find, again, in 19th century, especially Russian literature from Dostoevsky to others, as well as in, 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 in Sufi uh, poetry and, and, and liturgy. Now, I mentioned this idea of different organs of knowledge. Um, and I think that uh, one of them is, of course, the digestive organ, right? Is that is is to what extent, of course, our relationship to text is not purely uh, again cerebral and analytical, but sometimes your relationship to a text is is a gut relationship. And this is not just to be sort of facetious or an analogy, but actually, um, uh, neurologists increasingly in the West are trained at, are asked to study a gastroenterology, and this is, of course, a recent phenomenon, only in the past. 15, 20 years. But something that you would, of course, know, come across in Ayurvedic thought as well, or in the East, is that the stomach is a very articulate organ, or the digesticism is an articulate organ. It's just that we've been so focused since, since Descartes on this, that we've done at the expense of other, other organs of knowledge. And, uh, and this is a series of works that are called the uh, uh, Kitab Kebabs, meaning literally book kebabs. Um, and there, there are books from our reading, from our libraries that are literally skewered with a kufte skewer. Um, another uh, transliteration also led us to um, to translate, actually, uh, for the first time into English, a, a, arguably the most important periodical of the Muslim world of the 20th century, called Mullah Nasruddin, called this figure. So named after this figure I just mentioned, the 12th century sort of wise fool, 
but it was actually a, a political satire journal in, in published in, uh, in Azerbaijan, in Tbilisi, Tabriz, and, and then Baku in the Azeri language. Um, very progressive for women's rights against imperialism, against clericalism, against fundamentalism, which were six to eight pages and very um, brilliantly uh, illustrated. A very a typical example was this one, you have a Azeri man beating his Muslim wife and the same man being beaten by his Russian lover. So skewering the kind of double standards toward women, but, um, but, uh, but doing so in a way with, again, employing humor um, and of course, I would argue the most important, not only did Azerbaijan give women the right to vote before almost any Western country. So just to, as a kind of complication of the narrative that Muslim countries are uh, unilaterally or kind of uh, unequivocally uh, oppressors of, of, of women's rights, but also um, the, the language issue was very important for this journal, meaning that uh, putting the Azeri language um, as a legitimate language of publication was 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 unheard of until then. Until that moment, if you publish, you either publish in Russian or in sort of official Istanbul, Ottoman Turkish. And this was the first to put Azeri as an official language, not as a dialect. You can see many illustrations sort of showing the tongue. Now, this transliteration that I mentioned, of course, also shows to what extent alphabets accompany empires, right? So again, we think of alphabets and graphemes as, as maybe a, a, a Sasurian legacy. Uh, or other, we think of them as random, sort of, the, you know, you and I use the Latin alphabet, it just happens, you know, they're A that we write, it's, there's actually, all these alphabets, of course, have a company of empires. Um, the Cyrillic with, of course, the rise of, of, uh, of Orthodox faith, and then communism in the 20th century, several centuries later, which is one reason why uh, there was attempts to Latinize Russian, actually, uh, in, after the revolution, because many of the early, many of the Bolsheviks believed that uh, Cyrillic was tainted with sort of religious connotations because it came from this sort of the church Slavonic. Now, the only people whose alphabets were in the end changed in the in the in the Soviet Union and the Russian former Russian Empire were the Muslim subjects. Uh, nobody else, Armenians, the Georgians, they never had their alphabets changed. And the Muslim subjects, meaning everybody in Central Asia, essentially the Caucasus, mostly the Caucasus, uh, most of the people in the Caucasus, their alphabets were changed from first using Arabic script. So most of them are Turkic speakers in the Turkic language family, but they were using an Arabic script like Persian uses the Arabic script. Um, and they were changed to Latin in 1929 because, because uh, Latin was considered to be a, a secular script, right? Latin was considered to be kind of less religious or less, less dirty uh, than, than Cyrillic. And then, with, uh, and then it was changed from, from Latin to Cyrillic in 1939. Um, and then back to Latin. So you have this very strange phenomenon in, in many of these countries where you have three script changes within a hundred years. So you have three generations, let's say a, a grandmother, a daughter and a granddaughter who can speak the same language but can't necessarily read the same book. So in sense, again, in some sense, uh, becoming immigrants within your own language. And again, I, I want to come back to this idea of, of um, not, not just to, to uh, to toe the line towards the propos of this conference, but again, to understand this idea of language spatially. Here, literally as a kind of, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a border, as a, as, a, as, a, as a obstacle or an alphabet as an obstacle to one's own language, right? Imagine a, a, a country the size of Belgium just from one day to the next being asked to read from left to right as opposed to right to left and using a different alphabet. Another example is, um, in Russian, the term for God, for the, the, the term for Allah is transcribed as, as Allah, Allah with an X. So this is how it's written in Russian. There's X at the end. Again, the H that I mentioned. Because there's no, there is no H in Russian. There's no silent aspirate H. So Hitler is Gitler, for example, using a G. But here it, it was decided in Russian to have the H. Um, and ironically, uh, to kind of, again, to understand the, 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 to, to what extent imperial power structures determine questions of not only translation, but transliteration is Belarus language, the Belarusian language uh, is actually more equipped as, as is the Ukrainian to transliterate um, Muslim terms because in Belarus and in, uh, in Ukrainian, you have the huh, you have a, a silent huh. And so in Belarus, for example, when they write the, the Allah, Allah loves you is written here. They use the, 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 the aspirate H, which is a G written as a G, but it's actually pronounced as a Allah. So it's actually much closer to the original um, term. And the only reason of course it never survived is because 
because Russian was always a dominant uh, language of scholarship, right? And, and, and namely in terms of Orientalism. Now, all, one of the things about language, about alphabets and transliteration is that, is if we think about sort of recur and what recur, uh, Paul Recur talks about translation as a form of linguistic hospitality, meaning that, um, meaning that uh, I'm inviting the other into my language and I'm expropriating myself into the language of the other. In that sense, uh, in, if we follow this logic, then transliteration is a form of linguistic transvestism, meaning that it's about assuming the identity of another script, but not necessarily changing the, 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 the subjectivity itself. I think that's very important is when you're dealing with subject matter as obscure as most of the subject matter we're dealing with, let's say to large audiences in, in the West, but even elsewhere, it's very important to use what we call sort of stupid medium. Now, again, it's a form of, of, of solidifying text, of reifying a text in order to, to kind of bring it down, a kind of what I, a dumb media. And, and what I mean by dumb media is, uh, you know, we have a whole cycle of work called pickle politics about fermentation. What is dumber than a pickle, in a sense, right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a cucumber with in uh, and, and salt water and brine, but through this kind of prism of something stupid, like a cucumber or a monobrow or others, we can sort of tease out more complex narratives. Uh, we use fermentation, for example, to understand legacies of sort of binary legacies of the Enlightenment, right? In the sense that uh, what is fermentation other than a form of sort of uh, managed uh, preservation through decomposition? which again goes against the very kind of uh, binary thinking that we often associate. Here, this idea of to be or not to be, or it's often, it's very easy to make art something high and something low. So art, art is, is very easy to be the fool in taking serious subject matter and bringing it down, let's say it's kind of more pedestrian needs. But what's more challenging is how do we redeem the, 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 the esoteric, the gravitas from something which has been debased. And that's much harder to do, I think, as an artist. Um, and this is a good example. Uh, to be or not to be, it's a very stupid sort of frat boy type of uh, university uh, campus uh, humor. There's also the version of two beers or not to beers. Um, but they've taken a kind of important philosophical question, no matter how cliche it's become, and they've made it into a question of consumption. Now, how do we return that question of gravit sort of philosophical existential gravitas to the equation? Well, one way you can do that is by transcribing it into the Arabic, right? So if it's to beer or not to beer, um, if Nick drinks a beer or doesn't drink a beer, it's again, good on him either way, it makes no difference. But for a Muslim to drink a beer or not to drink a beer, immediately is a question of identity, belonging, existence in some sense, or, or being, right? Because it's not simply a question of consumption. It's a, it's a, it entails lot, much larger, let's say theological uh, responsibilities. Um, another example of this kind of transliteration is, uh, is an episode in the First World War, which, um, which essentially, if you're, if, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with the German, sort of Germany's late arrival into colonialism, but, but uh, Germany basically in the First World War convinced uh, the Ottomans to declare jihad on the Entente powers. So the uh, Sultan Rashid uh, declared, um, a jihad, a partial jihad against so against the French, against the, the Russians, against the, 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 the English, um, but on the side of the Turks, on the side of the Austro-Hungarians and on the side of the Germans. So a, a kind of partial jihad. And, um, and this jihad was very curious because it was accompanied by the construction of the first functioning mosque on German territory in Wunsdorf, so about uh, 70 kilometers south of Berlin in Sosen. Ironically, the same the, one of the large sites for one of the largest uh, refugee processing centers, migrant processing centers in 2015. So this is the first functioning mosque. It was part of a POW camp, a kind of a show camp that the Germans, the German uh, Germany basically wanted to show the Muslim world that we are your friends. Basically, rise up against your oppressors. The oppressors being obviously the enemies in the First World War. So rise up against the French. Rise up against the Russians. Rise up against the English. We will, we will be your your your. We will support you. Um, and it was probably the first example of, of instrumentalization of political Islam by a Western power, which we've seen again uh, up to this day. Um, and so they did this show camp with halal food, a functioning mosque. And the most interesting piece of this puzzle for me is there was published a, a uh, there was a, a newsletter published called El Jihad, meaning Jihad, right? That kind of a, this holy war. 
in the languages of the of the Muslim POWs that they that they cut, uh, and so in Arabic, here in Russian, in Arabic, and then of course in Turkish as well, and it was distributed to to the the POWs. Now the first thing that we notice is of course is that if you look at the way jihad is transcribed, it's D S C H, very clunky, four letters, D S C H for one sound. Why? Well, because there's no J in Arabic, in, uh, in, in German, right? Uh, so there needs to be a way to transcribe the J. So what we did is we looked into the Duden, which is the equivalent of the Oxford English Dictionary in German, let's say, the Larousse of the German language, and to find out other words that start with D-S-C-H. Um, and it reads like a greatest hits of sort of Orientalist terms. Um, Jadidismus, Jama, Djibouti, Jidda. My favorite, of course, is Djungelfiba. Um, God knows Germans just suffer from jungle fever, um, Genghis Khan. But it's, if you think about it, this DSCH, again, it's not just random. It's a kind of unconscious or conscious way for certain terms that are not Western, that are not ours, I guess, for German language to, 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 to identify as other. Because if you order a gin and tonic in, in Berlin, I guarantee you it won't be written gin and tonic DSCH. Or if you go by Levi's jeans, or you go by a jogging shoe, or you talk about gentrification, they won't be using the SCH. So it's okay to use a, a simplified form of this when it's a Western term, but when it's a Eastern, Oriental, Southern, Global, Southern, whatever you want, a kind of a, a brown person's term to cut short, to cut, to be a brief, uh, it has to, it uses this DSCH. Immediately after this jihad was declared in uh, Istanbul in 1915 or 1914, um, the English uh, intelligence services wrote back that this is a jihad made in Germany. And I thought that's also quite curious because there's many ways that I would find to criticize uh, something, but made in Germany is not the first thing that comes to mind. Because when I think of made in Germany, I think of what does it mean? Like it's a, it's a more expensive jihad. It's technically very proficient and sort of very well engineered. It'll cost a bit more money, but lasts longer. That's not, doesn't really sort of, doesn't sort of, doesn't come across as a diss, let's say, immediately. Um, now, I will quickly go through, uh, this is a shout out to Ingrid uh, with whom uh, we, we produced this work uh, called Never Give Up the Fruit about language politics in Xinjiang, uh, which uh, back in 2012, unfortunately Xinjiang is more and more in the news today with the, the genocide against the Uyghurs. Um, the Turkic languages are really the most interesting example of, of, of language politics because especially Turkey, right? First of all, what's interesting if you look at the Turkic languages is that it's uh, the, the geographical scope all the way from sort of Mongolia and Siberia to Turkey. Actually, Turkey is the, the, almost the most Western point or Bulgaria of the Turkic languages. But, um, but the, the, the language uh, revolution of, the, of, of Turkey in 1929 when Ataturk changed the scripts of the Turks, um, it's considered to be the kind of most open shot case. Nobody today in Turkey, not even the most sort of batshit crazy Salafist Wahhabi is asking to bring back the Ottoman script. So it's, it's done. And that's, that's a remarkable feat for something which is only 80 years old, right? The Turks used to use an, an Arabic script. And so as much as of course, there was an ideological reason for Ataturk to sort of hitch his ride to the West and that's why he wanted to Latinize the alphabet. There was, to be fair, there was an objective reason as well, meaning that Turkish has eight or nine vowels, depending on which Turkic language you're talking about. The Arabic script only has three. Now, uh, some of these vowels look like the German, the umlaut, this U, the U, uh, there's no way you can, I mean, there's no Arabic diacritic for these, right? So to be fair, there, are, there were many uh, vowels that couldn't be accommodated by the Arabic script and that can be accommodated by Latin, let's say. Well, one thing we forget is that when you change a script, you also uh, lose things, right? And one of the things that the Turks lost, the Turks used to have two Ns. They had a normal N like Nant, Nyahat, uh, and then they had another end, which is pronounced like this. Mm. And if you say mm, to yourself, I probably won't hear you because I think you're all muted, but not only does it sound like you're flirting with me on Zoom, mm, but it also just, it's, it's nasal. So again, it's another organ. It's kind of proboscis. It's, it, it, you know, we so often think about language as a tongue at the expense of all the other organs of language, which are all very erogenous, interesting enough, right? It's all very fleshy. The throat, the nose, the ears, the lips, Mm -hmm. is uh, sounds like you know it's uh, there's there's a there's a Wikipedia entry for 
Chinese people with the first name Ng, N-G, it's transcribed in English, in Latin. Uh, if you go order water spinach in a, in a restaurant, in, in, a, in a Chinese restaurant, in the Sichuan restaurant, you'll, out, you'll ask for Ng Choi, O-N-G uh, as well. Uh, so I don't think it's a coincidence that of all the sounds that were lost, this is the one, like a very Eastern sounding, Oriental sounding sound, uh, phoneme was one of the ones that was lost in Turkish. Because if, if you think about Turkish, some of the Turkish words that are most common, C, for example, Deniz, it used to be Deniz. Tanri, the pre-Islamic term for kind of the, the, the Genghis Khan era term for the great sky, the kind of for God, used to be, it's called now Tanri, but it's actually used to be Tanri. And you find this, the more East you go into Turkic languages, all the way to Uyghur, of course, Uzbek and Kazakh, there is still this ng, uh, ng. Um, now, one of the things that people often ask us is if we're so interested in discourse and publishing, why do we even create pieces? Why do we even create sculptures and installations, material work if there's so much inf interest in, in text? Now, one of the things is that, uh, at least in our practice, as I mentioned, uh, for us, text is not a platform or a, a medium through which to explore the non-rational, the non Critic, let's say the not analytical aspects or potential of art, meaning that if we're talking about other organs of knowledge and other, other forms of knowledge, whether they be metaphysical, phenomenological, emotional, digestive, for us, text is actually rather an articulate way of, of, of talking about these things, but, but only through other forms, meaning sculptural, uh, sound works, uh, uh, et cetera, installations, uh, perform, let's say, can we, can we explore those? Also, um, I want to end now because I want to have a quick, I would like to have a conversation with uh, Susan and, 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 and questions as well. Um, I want to end with an with a interesting um, criteria, case study of why certain alphabet changes work. Like we said, Turkish worked sort of remarkably well and others didn't. There was also an attempt to change, you know, when, you know, Hebrew was brought back by Zionists in the late 19th century, early 20th century. It used to be a liturgical, purely religious language, but it was brought back as a quotidian transactional language, secular language. Uh, relatively recently, let's say 100, 120, 30 years, and many of the of the of the of the proponents or the of the advocates of bringing Hebrew back were, of course, European Jews who were using Latin. So there was a strong push also to Latinize Hebrew for secular purposes and leave the leave the original sort of square letter Hebrew for the Torah and uh, and, and and Talmudic purposes, and this didn't win uh, out. And uh, Ilker Aitork, a scholar we work with. Uh, that has a very interesting comparative study. He says why certain language scripts, script changes work and others don't. One of the reasons that Turkish worked so well and Hebrew didn't is that there needs to be an inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis the script you're changing to. Turkish had this vis-a-vis -vis the West and Latin. Uh, European Jews didn't have this in the early 20th century. And also there needs to be a very low level of literacy. Turk literacy in, uh, in Turkey around the time of the Dil Devrimi in 1929 was I think six or 7%. Um, amongst European, uh, among Zionists, most of whom were European Jews, it was upwards of 30%. Uh, I will end with one, again, this idea of transliteration is, is another way of talking about this, is, this, is to, another term for it is, is, um, is homophonic translation. And homophonic translation means, this is an example of that, a very silly example, but a very interesting one. It's a whole book of nursery rhymes written homophonically into French uh, homophonically, but it's actually it remained in English, right? So. If you read this, you have to, again, like our panels, the, the broad terrace panels, uh, you have to recite this out loud to understand this. You cannot read, I cannot read this silently to myself, it makes no sense. But if I recite it, maybe you'll understand what it says. Ampti dampti setonos al, ampti dampti a de grete fal. Andolon kin sorses, andolon kin semen, camport ampti dampti together regen. Let me end then with, uh, then with uh, a quote from Marshall McLuhan. The Greek myth about the alphabet was that Cadmus, reputedly the king who introduced the phonetic letters into Greece, sowed the dragon's teeth and they sprang up as armed men. Languages are filled with testimony to the grasping, devouring power and precision of teeth. That the power of letters as agents of aggressive order and precision should be expressed as extensions of the dragon's teeth is natural and fitting. Letters are not only like teeth visually, but their power to put teeth into the business of empire building is manifest in our own Western history. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Bayam. This was such a rich um, presentation. I have um, a lot of questions, or not questions so much as triggers here to, uh, to in fact get you to, uh, to talk about some of these even more. I want to start backwards but with what you actually came to at the end uh, with that map of uh, what is the sort of the terrain of the Turkic languages you spoke of. And it's really, to me, always an interesting point to think about what we understand to be Turkic languages, to be actually hybrid of multiple languages from different ethnicities and, and sort of geographical, climactic, um, and other forms of um, experience that are uh, spread across a vast region. Um, and in fact, uh, Turkey is the last sort of, um, um, the last bastion of it, the inheritor. And in, in reality, it's further east, it's further inner Asia, it's further ex uh, expansively uh, included in uh, places south in the in the south part, in other words, Iran, Afghanistan, um, India, uh, are all beneficiaries of of these multiplicities of languages that become known as Turkic languages. And I wonder if you see embedded in that. I know that your sort of obsession with the with the Turkic languages, starting with the Mullah Nasreddin as one of the key elements that you start with. Um, is in fact extremely important in the way I understand your work. In other words, thinking in terms of how the, the um, it's not a, a single language, the way we understand language, but rather these varieties of dialects and, and expressions and practices and, and thinking met ways that come together from places that are you know, the steppe lands to places that are settled, plateaus, mountains, seas, and so forth. If you think that this, in fact, inspires something of the way that you work with language, but the way you look at language as a spatially sort of constructed uh, phenomenon, if you actually see it through uh, the multiplicities of ways that the Turkic languages are in fact uh, um, embracing these spatial constructions, if you will? I mean, uh, it's an interesting question. I think that, uh, you know, we don't often talk about to what extent, uh, let's say this expanse is, you know, it's very easy to kind of compartmentalize, right? That sort of uh, for people, not just all of us, but even let's say are not just as, as citizens, as people, as individuals, but also curatorially and artistically that, okay, a project about this particular sort of part of this region. Um, and, and, and I'm glad you asked that because it's, it's, it's something that, um, let's say the expanse, the, the, very, the very name Slavs and Tatars and this bio is, 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 part of, it's very important, this idea of totum simul, right? That the whole is in the part and the part is in the whole. You can't really dissociate. You can't, you can't actually understand it in isolation. Um, I was talking about, you know, some, with, uh, with Willem de Roy recently about the, uh, his uh, students at the his Berlin program for artists about the kind of artists that we respect very much are those artists whose work is not recognizable. Again, what like I said in the beginning, most artists, no matter, even if they're very good, a great, brilliant artist, 99% of artists' work is, is, is clearly belongs to that artist from 50 meters away. You go into a house, like, oh, that's, that's this so-and-so, that's so-and-so. And there's only a handful or so, let's say two handfuls of artists whose work you cannot recognize whose it is. And that's, that's uh, it's something that we admire. And I don't think that we achieve that. Mm. We have a very clear, let's say, uh, but but let's say that the the impenetrability is the is the is the scale of what you mentioned is that that even our work. Uh, I don't want to say that you have to see all the work all the time. That sounds sort of megalomaniacal, but it's very. It's we've had this feedback from curators very often is that it's very difficult to show one piece of art in a group show, for example, because mm. it doesn't function in that way. It functions as a kind of it either functions as a large brush stroke or it doesn't function in some sense. And that has its limits and has its advantages, right? That in the, in, I think our approach to language is very much like that, is that um, 
you know, you cannot, it's something that we came across with our, you know, we, we're often collaborating with universities and it's scholars, actually, it's, 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 it's colleagues of yours who were the first people to tell us that actually the kind of research that we're doing is very difficult to do in universities hmm. because of the kind of the, 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 the territorialism of departments, right? That in our region, particularly, if you study the Caucasus, you're either pushed into Ottoman studies, Turkic studies, Slavic studies, or Muslim studies, and where in fact you need all three. Mm. And, and, you, and you cannot understand, I mean, it's ridiculous if you think about to understand Dagestan or uh, Uzbekistan as a Slavicist. That's, 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 that sounds obscene, but also obscene to understand it purely as, a, as an Islamist or as a, as a, as a Turk. It, you know, it's kind of a, it's a very much, you need all three of those. Yeah, and I think that's really the point about, first of all, uh, not, to, uh, uh, not to repeat what you just said, but your work does, in fact, require a more sort of multidimensional, if I may use this uh, tired word, a, a larger sort of expensive approach to understand it. Each single one does not quite make as much sense as when you put it together with a collective. It's the, really the collective that makes best sense, I think. But one thing about it that you point out, and I wonder what you think about this, underneath a lot of what you do has to do, uh, or, or aims to dismantle, disrupt. Um, you use some very good words in your talk that I uh, have made note of, but I have to search for them, uh, to really dissociate um, all those disses, so to speak, which makes for a very um, anti-enlightenment rationality, a different form of rationality that you're talking about here, which is embedded in, in the kinds of linguistic and um, uh, practices and religions and and habits and, and even the use of the body organs to make those visible or, or tangible, that, that goes against the imperial hegemonic approach. This kind of a disruptive approach that you take to it has resonances in particular now with the, the conditions we live in. How much of it? I know you've been at it for a long time, but it seems that now it's even more compellingly of the date than it used to be. What do you think about that? Is there an, an, a particular sort of pushing of, a, of the boundaries that you can do here or do here actually purposefully that your, first, let's say, Mullah Nasreddin, when you started, did not do or did not envision at the time? I'm not sure. Uh, I, I can say that the, the industry, or let's say the milieu, has definitely um, is more explicit in its requests of what it wants from us. <laughs> what I mean by that is that it's more, so many, for many years, uh, it was never voiced, but now it's clearly voiced by institutions, curators, and others that they want, that, that what, they, what, what institutions want from us is, um, is, this, is in some ways to help them open themselves up to audiences they don't normally. So, you know, and, and I, it took me a while to understand this is that, mm. you know, again, if you think about the, 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 the entirety of, of all contemporary art pure programming has been hinged upon the, the a speculative spectator viewer who is versed in Western art history, right? Mm. Now, our work doesn't talk about art history uh, at whatsoever. I mean, the kind of Brothers is, is one of the rare, uh, is probably one of the only series of works that we, that we actually refer to a, a, any kind of contemporary art. Um, but it, it assumes a large body of knowledge that's, let's say, in some ways, is privileging your Iranian dentist, your Turkish engineer, your Russian uh, high school teacher, as opposed to your German normal Kunsthal or uh, Kunstverein member, right? And, and that's so. I don't want to use the kind of the, the terminology du jour, but it's in some sense, it's in some ways displacing or 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 decolonizing the audiences of museums just by the very uh, points of reference, right? Yeah. That the points of reference are privileging another body of knowledge and not the body of knowledge of art of Western history. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so now of course, museums are much more explicit. And then when they say, they, they actually now just say, we, you know, we in Hanover have never had the Turkish community. And it's not a, it's not a socioeconomic thing, right? As we know, is that, let's say 
it's not about being marginal people at all. Right. The Russian community in, in, in Philadelphia doesn't is not necessarily less well off than the Anglo community. It's just that they're not they don't feel welcome in, in contemporary art spaces. Right. And uh, and I think that somehow museums see us as a kind of a, as a way to and that's not our intention, but it's just, I guess they, that's that's kind of a confluence of interests, I guess, on some sort. Yeah, and it's a really interesting one that that we often think about um, artists and art production, whether you meant it or not, to be thinking a little bit, you know, having the the sort of feeling, having your your uh, fingers on the on the pulse as as it uh, it's pulsating. In other words, a little bit of a um, um, I don't mean to put uh, to use the Persian term hen dunezira babal, put watermelons under your arms and make you puff up. But it is this kind of an anticipation in a way, not that you anticipated, you were engaged in the kind of work that has now become so incredibly fashionable and important to really foreground, to bring people to, to think about things like I am uh, absolutely mesmerized by the very, uh, very unfriendly <laughs> business that you guys work with. That factor, the factor that a <laughs> as a, for instance, the, the Turkish speakers or Turkic speakers of Iran pronounce the <laughs> very profoundly and the Turks of Istanbul consider them lower class people because they don't turn it into a soft hair, right? Yes. It really goes under the skin, not only of a West East kind of a binary, but internal to these places that you work with to, to sort of think or, or peel away from the sorts of binaries or problematics of empire, privilege and lack thereof, marginality or centrality that are not just reduced to the European versus the rest. It's really actually internal very much in there. And I think that is one of the issues that you raise, which I wonder if you think of it that way. In other words, you're not just involved in the Russian versus the Central Asian or the, uh, the Caucasian, um, but also um, this bigger picture of the Ottoman centrality versus, let's say, the little guys in Azerbaijan or in Uzbekistan or the Azerbaijan of Iran or you know, these kinds of internal, imperial, marginal, and so forth, are these also part of your thinking, actually? It, it goes to kind of a, an issue that we had, uh, let's say, at a turning point in our in our career uh, around the Sharjah Biennial in 2011, where there was a, a, a lot of uh, questions from institutions that if, let's say, if, if we're not around to mediate these tricky things, you know, like what, uh, how, is, how is somebody supposed to access it. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it took me a while to understand that, uh, you know, the same is not asked of, let's say, uh, Walter de Maria, right? If you're seeing land art, you don't need to understand the entire history of 20th century minimalist art, pop art, land art to understand it. You can understand it purely on a formal level, but you can also understand it the more you invest, the more you take out. And I think that's where the humor for us is really key, right? Is that, is yeah. that uh, it, it's often a humor that's, first of all, not at the expense of, of somebody else. It's, 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 it tries to be a generous humor. But it's a humor that that hopefully it's, this is the question of kind of the, the 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 splits is that how to make the 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 uniniated and the kind of the local uh, yeah. laugh at the same time, right? The the, the, right. the kind of intimate knowledge and the person who's purely coming across this for the first time. Yeah, uh, that's not easy, and it doesn't happen often, but we try. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's one of the great challenges you have taken up, and it's a really interesting uh, problem. How do we how do we bridge these gaps? You're not speaking to the native, neither are you speaking to the outsider, in order to enlighten one or to uh, to um, maybe um, critique the other. But that they they can it can belong to everyone at the same time is a serious challenge. And I must say, you guys are. Are amazing at doing this. Listen, I'm very conscious of the fact that I have I have taken a whole lot of time, um, but I want to know if there are any questions from the audience that I can put forward to you. If I may uh, make a um, an effort at least to look at them. Uh, 
any thoughts or questions from the um, from the audience? Stella says, "What about a bad English or bad English T-shirts, which has a link to it? I don't know if you want to open it, but that's not the uh, perhaps uh, not the time for it." Um, so um, I wonder if I may, while you're uh, maybe you even fiddle around with this. If I can ask you one last thing, which has to do with the way you worked uh, on the, uh, or you um, implicate the organs, um, all these sort of body parts that are implicated in the making of um, not only the transliteration, translation, but also in the making of art in a way both physical art, but also these lectures and books and, and the performative aspects that permeate everything that you're doing. Um, I, I think of, for instance, the not only the tongue, but also what the tongue does, not only making noise in the voice box, but also tasting. I'm interested mm. in that aspect or the smell aspect, kind of sensory sides that are embedded in everything that you're working with. Uh, a pickle is, is you call it a pickle, but the mouth already begins to water at the thought of the pickle, right? Uh, so the unibrow, I, I have seen your chair for the unibrow in, in Munich, and it has, you know, it makes you tingle because you think the hair is going to be pulled out of your face and your eyes are going to water. There's that kind of a dimension of the body reacting to your work, which I find really interesting. Do you have some thoughts on that one to share with us? Yeah, I can't say I do beyond the, the idea that uh, somehow, again, it's this question of, you know, we're so invested in text and reading that yeah. it's, 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 we have to always think about how do we move beyond. Uh, I, I didn't want to imply in the, in, the, in the lecture that we don't think that poetry can achieve metaphysical phenomenological. Of course it can, it can be an effective. We're not poets though. Right. I can say that very clearly. We're <laughs> prose. We're very prosaic, um, and uh, and so for us, that poetry, if you will, is actually has to, can only happen spatially through material work, right. um, through yeah, through somehow translating the text into other medium. Uh, I guess. I mean, yeah. the, one of the things I'm always fascinated by is this question of translation, not just between languages, but also how you translate like a craft tradition, right? Like in our Iran Poland project, how do you translate a craft, a Catholic craft of painting behind mirror a glass to a Shia craft of painting behind? Is it is it the same craft or is it the same tradition? What is it? You know, yeah. So. Yeah. But what is the intermediary? It seems to me is that that sound element. And, and you noted that it has to be read out loud. And this re re reading out loud um, is the sound element that makes it poetic, makes it spatial, actually. And to imagine it in a spatial sense, that, that form of also breath sharing comes from that exercise. You called it hamdami, hamnafasi, and had other, other Russian and other ling linguistic terms for it. So anyhow. Okay, um, Nick, are we, uh, are we okay? Yes, okay. I want to say thank you very much, uh, Payam, and extend it to Kasha, uh, to Slavs and Tatars for giving us this amazing talk for this incredible, uh, really uh, insight into your work. So I'll quiet down and let Nick and his colleagues take over. Thank you, well, Sam, thank great you. to see you. Thank you both. That was brilliant. I, when I when I invited Payam and Kasia to to do one of these keynotes, I, I'm pretty sure I said to you, Payam, don't worry, I'm I'm not accusing you of being poets. It's, <laughs> but the work is definitely not prosaic. I'm not having that. It's brilliant, and it, and with such a rich insight as well. So thank you both, and for the brilliant chairship as well, Susan.